Good morning, everyone. It's really great to see everyone here. I'm so thrilled to be able to be uh, actually having th this event on both campuses. So good to see you folks in Lynn. Sorry we can't be closer, but this, I think, is really great. We'll give you a big wave. Good to see you. Uh, thank you every I want to thank everybody for coming. And on the be I'm Bernadette Lucas, and I I'm with the Interdisciplinary Department. And on the behalf of the criminal justice and the interdisciplinary departments, I would like to welcome uh, our expert speakers. And these folks are the are folks that really know what's going on. Uh, Congressman Tierney is running a little late, but he will be here. We have uh, Salem Chief of Police, Paul Tucker, who is going to be here to share his words with us, and also Jim Wallace, who is um, a member, a chairperson, actually, of the, the Guns o uh, Owners Action League. Uh, both um, Jim and Paul will be available after the close of this to answer some questions, so if everybody doesn't have a chance to ask their questions, they will be available. Um, I also want to point out to you is that the um, library has a checkout right outside, so if there's books that you would like to check out, you can just do it right there. So it's pretty exciting. I, I don't think I've seen this done like this before, I'm, but I'm really very excited that we have that. We have a lot to cover in a short time, so at this point I would like to invite President Burton to come to the podium and to share some words with us. Good morning and welcome to, to this forum which is extremely important on a, on a very important issue. Um, I've got some wonderful thing to say about Congressman Tierney, but he's not here, so I'll wait and tell him in person. Um, I certainly want to thank Chief Tucker and Jim Wallace for being here. And um, I would wanted to set the stage by um, reading from a piece I, I wrote last week for the staff. Um, in 2005, Lynn was suffering a huge increase in gang violence, and I thought the college uh, should definitely be involved. And I'm happy to say that uh, the project that came out of that ha has been of use. In the process, though, many of you might remember uh, Sarah Davis, who was then a Northeastern Law School student, who in the summer of 2005, while on a fellowship from the Rappaport Honors Program at Suffolk, founded, uh, assigned to the city of Lynn, did a project with Sandy Edwards, El El Ellen O'Donnell, and others of us. Her focus was on the creation of a gang prevention initiative, started in the Lynn Mayor's office, and later called Project Yes, and I was really pleased to say this year that the, um, Rich Cowdell, the principal of Marshall School, has credited that program with a significant decrease in violence in that, in that area, especially among young people. But Sarah also wrote a piece about one of her best friends, Eric Harris, who with Dylan Klebold walked into Columbine High in Colorado on April 19, 1999, guns blazing. They killed 12 students and one teacher wounded 23 others, and then killed themselves. Harris had been close friends with Sarah since the sixth grade in Plattsburgh, New York, and had moved to Columbine with his family before their senior year. Harris wrote an email to Sarah just before he left for the shooting that he did not send, and the FBI will not provide to Sarah, so we're not sure what he said. The piece she writes describes his descent into darkness, and you can feel the pain of this warm, caring young woman who could see this coming, but was unable to stop it. The section addressing the issue of gun control is one of the most insightful I've read, and though a little lengthy, uh, I, just, I just want to read it, just take a second, because I think it, it lays out some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. I'm quoting from Sarah Davis now, who had a wonderful relationship with Harris before he moved to Colorado. Quote, I would say that guns were a major part of Columbine. We are talking about an incident that occurred in a state that is notoriously gun friendly. Now, I, I would note that Colorado just enacted last week some of the tighter gun laws in the country. Eric grew up in a military family where guns might be more acceptable than elsewhere. Then you add in that he played a lot of violent video games and watched violent media. I don't want people to think I'm blaming the media for what Eric grew into. But the combination of being in a gun-friendly environment and becoming numb to violence could be dangerous for a young person. And there is more to that that goes with it. The influence of depression and the lost hope and the vision for the present and future. 
The fact that guns are so easily accessible is a huge problem, and it makes it so much easier for tragic things like this to happen. If you can't get a gun, you can't use a gun. But then again, if they didn't have access to, to guns and wanted to do it badly enough, they probably would have figured it out. The way I see it, it all ties. It all ties in. The guns, the violence, and the circumstances that push young people to want to kill each other and themselves. Take away all the guns and you are left with huge issues that may lead a person to take such action. It's not okay to give up on young people and there are a lot who are hurting badly. We can threaten jail or worse, but it won't matter if they don't care about themselves or about the consequences. And you could take away the anger and the lack of self-worth and the rest of it and you would still, and you would still be left with readily available guns. Young people will still die. Sarah received her law degree and worked as a juvenile public defender in the Youth Advocacy Department in Boston, dedicating her life to preventing child violence. She now works at the Legal Rights Center in Minneapolis in the Legal Aid Department. I'm very proud to be a friend. Um, second thing I wanted to mention that I am the national chair of the Community College Consortium on Autism and Intellectual Disabilities. And I want to make sure everyone knows that there's been no proven link between Asperger's, autism, and violence. And, and to, there are, now there are other kinds of personality disorders, but it bothers me now that some folks who are on the autism spectrum are discriminated against because of that. I, I've come to know a lot of students with autism and they are the nicest, kindest people I know. And I just wanted to say that. Uh, and third, I want to compliment our library for a mobile checkout outside. Bill Munier is out there, and, and I really suggest you read uh, significantly on both sides of the issue because there's a lot of good information out there. Unfortunately, in the flashpoint of the political arena, this, a lot of this information gets lost. It's a very complex issue, and uh, you've got some excellent speakers today to speak to all sides of that issue. And so I hope you'll listen with open minds and uh, I look forward to, by the way, Congressman Tierney has is, been great for us uh, on Pell Grants and everything else, and, and let me say that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Savannah. Thank you. So Thank much. you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Savannah Overton. I'm brand new adjunct faculty. I teach school violence and race, class, and gender. Um, I would like to basically just introduce each of the speakers to you here today. Uh, but first, I just want to do a little housekeeping. Please make sure your cell phones are off or on silent, please. We want to give the speakers as much respect as they deserve. Um, Today, today you'll hear from both Jim Wallace and Chief Tucker, as well as Congressman Tierney. Um, I will read a brief bio about them individually, and then we'll follow up their presentation with um, one question that a student has asked, and then I'll open it up to the audience if we have time uh, to address another question. And again, as Bernadette said, you know, at the end of the, if we have time at the end, we'll be able to ask additional questions. Um, each of the speakers will have a strict time limit, so we want to just move this right along. Uh, first, let me introduce. Um, Police Chief Paul Tucker. <laughs> Paul Tucker is the Salem, Massachusetts Police Department Chief of Police. Chief Tucker began his law enforcement career in 1979 as a member of the Salem State College Police Department. In 1981, he became a member of the Nashaw, New Hampshire Police Department, where he served with distinction until 1983 when he began his career at the Salem Police Department. After serving as a patrolman, he went on to become a detective, and in 1989, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant. In 1992, he was promoted from sergeant to captain, and as a captain, he served as a commander of the Criminal Investigation Division for 17 years until his promotion to chief of police in October of 2009. Chief Tucker holds a Bachelor's of Science in Criminal Justice, a Master's of Art in Criminal Justice, and graduated magna cum laude from Massachusetts School of Law in 2000. Chief Tucker has been an active adjunct faculty member of area colleges since 2000, teaching a variety of criminal justice courses. In addition, Chief Tucker is a graduate of the FBI National Academy and an active member of the Massachusetts Bar Association. Please help me in welcoming, welcoming Chief Police Tucker. Thank you, Savannah, and thank you for the opportunity to come here today. Thank you, President Burton and the staff at, at North Shore. 
where I've uh, been a proud adjunct faculty member here since 2000. And I see a, a, at least a few of my former students here. It's glad to have everybody here this morning. Let me first say that, that to begin, uh, I personally respect the right of any individual to own a gun, providing that, that they are suitable, providing that it's for lawful purposes, and knowing that it's not absolute and not without some restriction. I've tried to find some common ground in my own mind during this latest debate, particularly since the Newtown tragedy. As I've thought back and forth about the rights of gun owners, the right for proper restrictions, I've come to some resolution, at least in my mind, about where I think that this debate should be headed. And I'm, I'm very pleased that, that uh, the college has sponsored this this morning. For those of you that watched 60 Minutes last night, you saw the real life anguish of parents who lost children. And I think for the first time in, in at least my recent memory, uh, there has been a national discussion finally about gun control. We've talked about it after Columbine. We've talked about it after Aurora, Colorado. We've had different discussions, but nowhere, I think, have we seen the outpouring of emotion and thought that we saw after the Newtown tragedy. As I've made my own way through this debate, as I said, I've tried to balance the, the, the right to own a gun, which I do believe in the Second Amendment, but I also think that there has to be some proper restrictions. Now, one of the topics I've been asked to talk about is licensing. And let me say this, that in Massachusetts, I don't think we get it right. We have th 351 cities and towns where each police chief has the right to solely and individually determine suitability, who's a suitable candidate. And I think what happens is we have an uneven application of the suitability law. In Salem, I have a, a strict uh, suitability guideline. If somebody deserves a handgun, if it's for lawful purposes and they make a showing, they'll receive their license to carry. Sometimes we have people that come in, file an application, they may get a target in sport or they may not get any license. I make the best determination that I can. Uh, Mr. Wallace, who I've had the pleasure of meeting before, does a fantastic job as Executive Director of Goal. Um, we have maybe some disagreements on how the, the restrictions should be applied, but I think we have to respect the position of the gun owners, and particularly Goal, that's represented here today. Some of the proposed laws that I've looked at that, that I think should be enacted, some of the things that are, that are being debated now, and I would note that Connecticut, I believe last week, uh, Governor Malloy just stepped up and signed uh, probably some of the most restrictive gun laws in the country. I know President Obama is going to Connecticut today. I've also looked at some of the uh, uh, laws that uh, are proposed for Massachusetts, and I'm gonna, I've, if time permitting, I'm going to cover a few of them. Some of the things that I think are appropriate in terms of restrictions, one is to close some of the loopholes. I know that in, in certain parts of the country, not so much around here, but to a small extent, there is so-called gun shows, where the restrictions are, are, are very loose and, and private gun sales where, where no gun dealer is involved. Those are some of the things that, that, to me, I think need more scrutiny. A waiting period. I personally don't think that anybody should be able to walk in today and be able to buy some type of large capacity handgun and walk out immediately with it. We're going to see that there's some common themes in some of these mass shootings. Some of the common themes are anger, mental illness. We've seen in, in almost every one of these cases, in, with, the, with the luxury of hindsight, looking back, that there were certain signposts along the way that somebody either could have said something or should have. When we dissect these, these mass shootings, and I know the Secret Service have done a number of, of after actions on these, we see some common themes. So I think a waiting period is a, is a sensible restriction. I'm also in favor, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there'll be another side to the coin on this, in a ban on assault weapons. When we have uh, the ability to have 30 round magazines with an assault weapon, I just don't see where, where that would be necessary in today's society. I'll note that Colorado, which uh, over the years has earned a reputation of, of sort of the Wild West and, and has a great place in history, uh, recently signed a limitation on a 15 round limitation on the capacity for the magazine. If Colorado can do it, why can't some of the other states do it? 
better mental health reporting. President Burton mentioned, I think, some of the misperceptions, and I couldn't agree more with the statement that he made uh, about some of the, about the misinformation that's out there. But clearly the other side of this has to be that we do need some type of mental health information that has to be transmitted to, I got the time out already. <laughs> If I can have 20 seconds, step in my shoes just for a moment as a police officer. Two parts to it. One is the guns that we face on the street every day. If you walk in my shoes, I've been on the job 32 years. The unknown and the uncertainties of facing the guns. The second part of it is, and I've done this far too often, go to a family member's home and tell them that tragedy has been visited upon their home because of gun violence. If we can't get it done now, we never will. Thank you. I'm sorry, I missed the two minute and the one minute signpost. <laughs> Did we go right to the timeout? <laughs> um, we have a question from the, oh, oh, this, yeah. is that question number six? Yes. Okay. okay, great. Yep, um, I'm Dominic Valella. Uh, do you believe civilians should be able to own automatic weapons? If so, for what reason? Thank you, Dominic. Um, I feel that there should be a ban on assault weapons. Uh, I don't see the need for it in today's society. I think a sensible restriction would be this. If somebody goes to a gun range or, or, or a, a certified uh, safe place to shoot, that they should have access to it. If somebody wants to own it, they could keep it locked in the safe at, at, the, um, uh, at the gun range. They could enjoy the recreational aspect of it. But in terms of privately owning it, I would be against it. I also think that, that in addition to that, the more thorough checks and maybe some training and safety to go along with it. I think that to, to give somebody an assault weapon and have, have the ability to carry that, there's no requirement of training. The only thing we, we, that we require is that it be stored safely. I think that's inadequate. Thank you for your question. Okay. Do we have time for another? Or? Okay, great. Okay. Um, we'll open it up to the audience. Is there anybody else that has a question for Police Chief Tucker? Okay, just give us a minute for the microphone, please. Thank you, so that the Lynn campus can hear you. Uh, first name is Ognin, last name is Radic. I believe we met before. Uh, I have a question regarding the assault weapon bans. Um, how many did uh, police officers actually own um, assault weapons? How would that affect them? Even in their personal use and their work use? Because I personally belong to a two different gun ranges. I see a lot of them owning the type of firearm. Okay, so Thanks. the question is, if a, if a police officer owns it as a private citizen, owns a, a, I think that, that as we've seen with any law, uh, the laws apply to police equally and have to be enforced fairly, whether it's a police officer or a private citizen. I would just add that um, when we give police officers their weapons, we have extensive training. It's 40 hours of handgun training. It's 20 hours of shotgun training. It's in-service training twice a year. Why should we require any less for a citizen to be able to walk in to purchase a high capacity automatic weapon and not require anything else except that license to carry and if they store it properly? So to, the, the short answer also is the law should be applied equally to police officers as they are for private citizens as well. Thank you for your question. Thank you so Appreciate much. it. Thank you. Thank you to our um, police chief, Tucker, and as well, we'd like to introduce Congressman John Tierney. Thank you for joining us as well. Okay. I would now like to uh, turn the floor over to um, Executive Director of Gold, Jim Wallace, but let me first just give you a brief bio. Jim Wallace has been the Executive Director of the Gun Owners Action League of Massachusetts, GOAL, since 2005. He is an avid sportsman and gun owner. Raised in Groveland, Massachusetts, Jim served our country in the United States Army from 1983 to 1986. Before becoming Executive Director of GOAL, Jim co-founded the Massachusetts Society of Outdoor Sportsmen and was the president of the Essex, Essex County League of Sportsmen. As an advocate for sportsmen in Massachusetts, Jim helped lead advocacy efforts for legislation that created a more streamlined and fair gun licensing system, protected gun clubs and shooting ranges from costly compliance measures, and restored the Fish and Game Fund to the state budget where dollars are spent to maintain the Commonwealth's wildlife areas. 
As the executive director of Gold, Jim steered important legislation protecting the rights of the Commonwealth sportsmen and gun owners and continues to protect their rights from being usurped by unnecessarily restrictive licensing and regulatory processes. Some of his key accomplishments include passing legislation that allows the sale of competitive target shooting handguns in Massachusetts and which clarified the law regarding the transportation and usage of loaded firearms. Most recently, Jim's advocacy stopped efforts to restrict handgun sales in the Commonwealth to one gun a month during the 2011-2012 legislative session. Jim will continue his advocacy against unduly restrictive measures that infringe upon the Second Amendment civil rights of Massachusetts citizens during the 2013-2014 legislative session. Jim lives in Newburyport, Massachusetts with his wife Holly. They have one daughter, Caitlin, who's a senior at Bridgewater State University. He's an avid upland game and waterfowl hunter. He hunts with his four-legged children, his bird dogs named Zena and Shoni. Please welcome Executive Director of Gold, Jim Wallace. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Everybody awake? Oh, pretty lame. Good morning, everybody. That's a little bit better. I guess, sorry, I got a little touch of sore throat, so I brought the water up so I didn't pull a Marco Rubio on you. Um, well, my name is Jim Wallace. I am the executive director of Gun Owners Action League. Uh, obviously, there is a, a lot of discussion going around nationwide and, and in Massachusetts uh, as far as firearms legislation goes. Uh, I do need to correct one thing, though. Assault weapons are not automatic weapons. Assault weapons are actually semi-automatic weapons by nature, which means semi-automatic for every pull of the trigger, one round goes off. If it was automatic for one pull and depression of the trigger, the gun would continue to fire as long as there was ammunition in the magazine. So we're not actually talking about automatic weapons. We're talking about semi-automatic firearms, okay? Just to make that straight. Now in Massachusetts, one of the problems we have is some very, very convoluted gun laws. As a matter of fact, they're so difficult to understand there's actually a retired police chief that publishes a 400-page book on how to begin to understand the Massachusetts gun laws, and he gives eight-hour seminars along with that book so that people can begin to understand what's expected of them. If you as a citizen need a 400-page book to begin to understand what's expected of you, we're already done before we started. It's absolutely ridiculous. And just to give you a, a, a kind of reference point, in 1998, the state of Massachusetts passed a Gun Control Act, a complete rewrite of the Massachusetts gun laws. Back then, we had 1.5 million licensed gun owners in the state of Massachusetts. Now we are down to about 250,000, and that number is growing in the last couple of years, obviously. So an 80 to 85 percent reduction in licensed gun owners. The problem is the Massachusetts Department of Public Health has just put out reports that in that same time period, gun crime is up 200 percent. So we reduced the number of lawful gun owners by 80 to 85 percent, but gun crime increased by 200 percent. So we obviously did something wrong as a state back in, back in 1998. The biggest issue is they continue to go after the thing, not the human criminal element. And until you start addressing the human criminal element, you will continue to have problems as a society. Now one of the things that, that we have to face here in Massachusetts is how do you reform the gun laws to respect the civil rights of citizens, but get much tougher on the criminals? And that's exactly what we need to do here in Massachusetts. Excuse me. One of the problems is the people who purport to support the Massachusetts gun laws always try to go around the country and say, this is the example, this is what you need to do, because Massachusetts has some of the lowest gun death rates in the country. And that's true, we do have some of the lowest gun death rates in the country. The only thing that really protects us here in Massachusetts from more violent crime, believe it or not, is our economy. Because if you look at all the impoverished areas of the United States, you will find the highest crime areas. Crime basically uh, goes to impoverished areas, impoverished areas and feeds on it. Massachusetts is saved a little, bit, a little bit because of our economy. But if you compare Massachusetts to Massachusetts 15 years ago, our violent crime rate is higher. Now, when you take guns out of the picture and just look at violent crime, such as aggravated assault, uh, forcible rape, those kind of things that the FBI tracks, how many people would have thought that Massachusetts has the highest violent crime rate in the Northeast per 100,000? 
We're even higher than New York or New Jersey, and we're almost double any other New England state there is. The problem I see is that because we continue once again to focus on the thing. And I had this debate the other day on, on a radio show about so-called large capacity magazines. Now you have to understand that nationwide there are millions of these magazines owned, millions that have never been used in a crime, that are used lawfully every day across the country. The people who own them respect the law, but because unfortunately we've had a couple of people who have instituted mass tragedy on us, we now want to ban the thing. Well, the problem is you can ban anything you want, but if they have the means or, or the thought to get into those areas uh, where they can commit mass crime, mass murder, they're, they're going to do it, period. So we as a society need to look at certain things. Like, for instance, if you want to talk about high-capacity magazines because they're, they're such a threat to public safety, well, what about Timothy McVeigh? He blew up an entire building, brought down a nursery in the basement of that building, killed everybody. Was there any discussion about banning rental trucks or fertilizer or diesel fuel? You know, there was, but it didn't happen because people realize that, you know, you can, you can ban certain things, it's just not going to stop certain people. So, but back to the laws at hand, again, we need to make sure that they respect the civil rights of people who are out there who actually respect the law themselves, and to make sure that we're going after the human criminal element, which we just simply don't do, especially in this state. Oh, I got the time out already. So, yeah. We, um, thank you so much, actually. Sure. Let's give them a yeah. Now we're gonna test the waters a minute. We have a question from the Lynn campus. Frank, can you present your student? Thank you. Hi, my name is Ashley. Um, what laws are being proposed to protect schools um, specifically? Should we provide either police or armed security guards for all schools? Thank you, Ashley. Uh, well, there's kind of two questions here. What laws are being proposed that's going to stop another new town? Uh, unfortunately, the catalyst for us being here today in the discussion that's happening nationwide is that we had a killer in the classroom. And there isn't one single proposal I have seen anywhere across the country or any of the laws that have been passed uh, through knee-jerk reaction in New York, Connecticut, Maryland, uh, and a few other places. There is nothing in those proposals that would stop a killer from getting into the classroom. And that's what we need to address. Uh, what was the second part of the question? See, Ashley's off the microphone, so I didn't get it. I think it was yeah. school, armed school guards. Armed school guards. There's a, there's a lot of misinformation that, that the NRA and groups like Goal have called for arming teachers. Uh, it's actually a myth. They've never actually called for arming teachers themselves. I think teachers got enough work to do. Security is a specialized, is a kind of a specialized field. Uh, and one of the things we need to do, now, now here's the real big deal on this. Whether you have security guards that are armed, law enforcement, whatever you want to call them, resource officers, which a lot of inner cities already have. The biggest thing we need to make sure we overcome is the perception that schools and other places like that are easy targets uh, for these cowards. And that's the problem. The perception is there that it's an easy place to get in and do mass harm. We need to look at all of the different things we can do to make sure that that perception is undone. Now, I know there might be people who disagree with me, but I'm going to tell you right now, as someone who deals with training, a single can of pepper spray in the front office of Newtown changes that whole outcome. Now, would anybody die? I don't know. But I know a criminal who's writhing in pain from pepper spray is not in there executing children. Those are little things that we need to look at to deal with the perception that these are easy targets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I had a, a quick question for you. Uh, sure. You made a clarifying comment in the beginning about yep. automatic, semi-automatic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I used an M16 for a year during combat operations in Vietnam. Yep. Uh, the M16, I fired single shot when I had a clear target. But when I want to shoot a lot of people at once, I just flicked a switch and it went full automatic, right? right. So on assault weapons, you said they were either semi-automatic or automatic. Isn't it true that an M16, an AR-15 can go either way? No. 
No, is the AR-15 only? An M-16 is the military version. It's, it's called, a, we, having been former military, we call it select fire, which means you can select semi-automatic or full automatic. And actually now the M4s that they fire, for the most part, is a three round. You can still go a select fire. What we are talking about, this whole debate is about, is the civilian version of the military platform. It does not have select fire. You can only fire one round at a time. And, and that's really what, and here's the greatest irony. What legally is considered an assault weapon is purely cosmetic. If you look at the old <clears throat> federal law and what still exists in Massachusetts, what makes an assault weapon an assault weapon is not how it fires, but what's on it. And it, for instance, it has to have two of, I believe it's five features. Uh, collapsible stock, a bayonet lug, a flash suppressor, a pistol grip, and actually they threw in grenade launcher. I, I know a lot of gun guys, but I don't know who's got a grenade launcher, so. Um, but so far, I've never heard of a drive-by folding stock incident. I've never heard of a drive-by bayoneting. So, you know, that was the irony, was the general public really had no idea what the conversation was about because they hear assault weapon, they think machine gun. And it complete, now here's the, the real irony. If you had the correct license, you could own the machine gun version, but you could not own the semi-automatic version. But that's what the debate was about. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, our last speaker. Uh, is the distinguished Congressman John Tierney. I'm going to read a little bit about his bio and then turn it, the floor over to him. Uh, having, recent, having been recently re-elected to his ninth term representing Massachusetts 6th District, US, Represent John, U.S. Representative John F. Tierney has developed a national reputation as an effective legislator fighting for families, seniors, and small businesses. The Congressman remains the only member from Massachusetts serving on the Committee on Education and the Workforce, serving on the Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Training, and the Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions in the 113th Congress fighting for a vibrant middle class and working to, create, working to create opportunity for all, Congressman Tierney has been an active leader on the education and labor issues. His hard work and commitment to ensuring the legislative branch conducts vigorous oversight have earned Congressman Tierney the chairmanship of the National Security and Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform from 2007 to 2010. Chairman Tierney undertook a variety of investigations to ensure that the United States policy utilizes all aspects of our national power and maximizes our long-term national security interests, that taxpayer money is not being wasted, and that we leave our children and grandchildren a safer place to live. Born in Salem, Massachusetts, Congressman Tierney attended Salem Public Schools and graduated from Salem State College. He earned a law degree from the Suffolk University and until he took office in January 1997 was partner in the law firm of Tierney, Khalees, and Lucas for over 20 years. He and his wife Patrice continue to make Salem their home. Please help me in welcoming Congressman John Tierney. Thank you so much. Pleasure to meet you. Well, thank you, Professor, and welcome everybody uh, both here and in Lynn my friends over in Lynn. Uh, Dr. Burton, thank you for uh, allowing this forum to go forward today. And I thought I might take my few moments here and try to reframe the debate. Uh, and I would hope that as we're talking about this issue, which tends to be sensitive, everybody's mind, right around the country, we try to establish what the frame for this debate is or should be. It should be about safety, safety in our homes, safety in our schools, and safety in our communities. This isn't any longer about whether or not people have the right to possess and bear arms. You know, this isn't a situation where on one side you have people that don't want any guns at all, and on the other side you have people that only want guns without restriction. If you read the Heller case, which was the District of Columbia versus Heller case decided by the United States Supreme Court, they very clearly said that the right to bear and own arms is protected. Nobody's trying to relitigate that. They also said it applies equally to federal laws and to state laws. And I've not heard anybody try to litigate that, although I do hear a lot of people go around as if Anybody who talks about safety is trying to ban people's guns completely. And I think we have to move off of that discussion and hopefully be a little more rational because that's not what this is about. But even the court in Heller, while it was saying very clearly that you have a right to possess and carry arms, it said it's not a right to keep any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, or for whatever purpose. It listed a whole retinue of restrictions that could lawfully be put on the right to own, possess, and carry guns. 
and that wasn't exhaustive. So we went through the whole history of what had been reasonably put on in the 1930s, when even the NRA was trying to make sure that they banned machine guns in the height of the crime wave at that point in time of prohibition. So it said that there are things that you can do to talk about what kind of weapon and how it is possessed and whatever purpose it is used for that can be restricted, and that's what the debate should be around. What is it that we think is reasonable? What firearms should be usable and which should not to give people a better feeling of comfort and safety in their neighborhoods, their schools, and their homes? How should it be used safely to give that same feeling of security on that basis? And whatever purposes should it be used for? And if we focus on that, I think we'll have a much better discussion uh, around this issue and move it on. Now, some people think that we ought to focus on what gun ownership is. If we look at who should own a gun, it shouldn't be anybody that's dangerous to themselves or to other people. And the court indicated very clearly that's a valid consideration. So if you're going to talk about mental health backgrounds on people, you have to be careful to indicate you're talking about those people with mental health issues that make dangerousness the point here, danger to themselves or to others. You have to talk about their rights of privacy. Will it be necessary if they want to own a gun that they have to waive their right of privacy to disclose their records so somebody can make a determination of whether or not they're dangerous to themselves or others? We talk about dangerous felons, violent felons, not being able to open a gun. We think that would be unreasonable if they were allowed to do it. We talk about people that are accused and guilty of domestic violence, that they not uh, be able to use weapons on that basis because we think that would be too dangerous to themselves and to others. We talk about background checks to make sure that those things are enforceable, make sure that they're reasonable on that. A comprehensive background check, it could restore a simple, single, equitable structure for retail sales on that that everybody is subject to. It makes you reasonably able to distinguish uh, who is selling those because anonymous sales and sales that are undocumented and are private party sales, not just sales in gun shows, but private person to person sales other than family members and on that basis, they are a significant factor in handguns and other guns being passed along and ending up in bad use. 90% of the background checks done by the FBI happen instantaneously. The others may take up to three days. So the question is, is a three-day wait when there's a question about the person's background reasonable or unreasonable? And that's what the debate ought to be about. But you should note that only 1% of the federally licensed dealers are responsible for the sale of 57% of the guns that are traced to crime and incidents in this country. So you would think it would make sense to know who those dealers were and to be able to make sure we had a balanced inspection regimen so to make sure that they don't continue to sell to straws and others on that basis. Yet the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms people by law, after all the lobbying is done and everything, are only allowed to do one background check inspection a year. But worse than that, they're only funded with the ability to do one every 17 years. Now, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, they mandate state regular inspections. They're the only two states that do. 23 other states allow regular checkups, but don't require it on that. So we have to ask, is it reasonable to have background checks? Is it reasonable to look at and inspect our dealers on that to make sure that they're not selling uh, to store our purchases and others on that basis? The ability to know is important. And we debate the restriction on what types of arms should be used. As the court said, it's not for whatever kind of arm under whatever circumstances whatsoever. So is it reasonable to have large capacity in your magazines? Is there some reason that you couldn't ask a gun over to please don't have 30 or 20 or 15 in your magazine at a given time? Is it unreasonable to say to them that if you only use three for duck hunting and five for deer hunting, that you not use an unlimited amount in a situation where somebody may take that gun and even though the owner may not be a person who would do something illegal, it might end up in the hands of somebody who would, and then they have that kind of a situation where they can expose that. The same thing about what kind of a weapon it is itself, whether it's an assault weapon or not. Isn't there a right to prevent the dangerousness and unsafe use? Restrict the number of bullets and the type of weapon, restrict where and when it might be used. And some people I know in Massachusetts have talked about restricting certain types of weapons to the gun range or to a hunting uh, resort or wherever it might be on that basis. Keep in mind that if we had just 5% reduction in the number of incidents a year, the number of uh, people that were shot and prevented that, that would be some 650 shootings for every 1%. It's $28,000, almost $29,000 just for the medical cost on average of those shootings. If you add in the criminal justice and other costs associated with it, it's a million dollars. So just 650 incidents, 1%. One, one, uh, 
would be a $650 million savings a year, not to speak of the value of the life involved. But I want to propose something else that I'm going to introduce as a bill this week, and it's the Personalized Handgun Safety Act. You know, we have a lot of incidents that result from people using a handgun either accidentally or because it's stolen on that. I think it's in our national interest to protect people from violence of accidental firearm sales and deaths. We can personalize a gun right now so that only a person that's authorized to use that gun can fire it and nobody else. The other owner can lawfully own the gun, can possess it and carry it with the comfort of knowing that if their gun is stolen or left someplace and somebody gets at it accidentally, they can't be fired because that person wouldn't be an authorized user. The Center for Disease Control tells us that in 2011, 851 accidental deaths occurred. In 2010, 62 of those accidental deaths were people under the age of 15. That would speak to the incident of Brian Crowell, whose mother, Anne Marie, was my guest down at the State of the Union address this past year. Her 12-year-old son on Christmas Eve went to the house directly behind theirs to visit his 14-year-old friend. And after he hung up from his sister, Brian, sister who told him he had to get right home for the big family gathering, his 14-year-old friend had somehow found his mother's gun. Now, she had that handgun and was licensed. Presumably, she thought she had it someplace where her son wouldn't know where it was, wouldn't get it. But he did. And in showing it to Brian, the gun went off and shot Brian in the neck, and Brian died. If we had personalized handguns, Brian wouldn't, his friend never would have been able to fire that gun, and he'd be with us here today. There are 250, 350,000 incidents of firearm theft from private citizens every year. The FBI tells us that 45 law enforcement officers in the last nine years or so had their weapons arrested from them and used fatally against the law enforcement officer. These types of things wouldn't happen if we had a personalized system on our handguns. So my legislation is going to propose that the Consumer Protection Safety Commission consult with the National Institute of Justice and determine what is the safe standard for personalizing a handgun on that. Two years after that date, no manufacturer will be able to manufacture lawfully any gun, handgun, unless it's personalized. In three years, if you're going to make any sale, it has to be retrofitted to be personalized on that. And the funds for that will come from the forfeiture fund that the Department of Justice has that's almost a million dollars, $800 million every year. So after that date, if you manufacture a gun or you sell a gun and it's retrofitted and it's personalized, you've met that standard, even if it's used in an unauthorized way and causes injury, you won't be held liable because you'll have done your job. But if you don't, you will be held liable. This talks about the debate in the sense of talking about what's safe, what protects your right to own a gun and to carry a gun, at the same time what gives you the comfort as a gun owner to know that your gun won't be used in an unauthorized manner to cause injury unnecessarily to somebody else, whether it's a suicide or an accident or a stolen gun being used in a crime. I hope it adds to the debate. I hope it adds to the safety of our schools and our neighborhoods and our communities. And I hope we can try to focus the discussion and all elements of this around those issues of if you have a right to carry and to own, how can you do it most reasonably, sensitively to your neighbors and your other citizens so that it's safe in our neighborhoods, our schools, and our communities? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from a student, Emily Moss, in the back. Can you stand up, please, so we can give the mic to you? Hello, I'm from Savannah's school violence class. Um, should there be a maximum amount of guns or ammunition someone can possess for their own entertainment, collection, or protection? Well, I think if you're talking about handguns, if my legislation were passed, that wouldn't be an issue. So you would have the personalized uh, aspect to it, and I think that would tamper down some of that debate. Uh, I think that the problem that we have is if you're going to have a state-by-state -state restriction on the number of handguns, it hasn't done a very good job because people are going to New Hampshire, Vermont, Virginia, and other places and doing it. Uh, if you think that it's reasonable to do that, we have to do it on a national basis, and we have to make sure that we have a reasonable amount. I don't know why people need, you know, multiples of guns on that basis on that, and it doesn't offend me that we would restrict the number, but if you're going to do it, you have to do it in a way that's effective. Okay. Time for another? Okay. Um, is there an open question? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Michael Tarnico. Um, my question is, why do you think people are opposed to simple background checks, um, and how would you personalize a firearm? 
Okay. Well, the, uh, let me start with this. Why do I think people are opposed to a background check? I mean, you'd have to ask them. I really, you know, the, I can't tell you all the reasons on them. I'm sure they can articulate why on that basis. I think privacy is one issue uh, that people may have a concern with, and I think that we can do it in a way that doesn't offend people's sense of privacy on that, but particularly gets dicey, as I mentioned, around the mental health issues. If you're going to restrict people because you think whatever mental health issue they have makes them dangerous to themselves or others if they have a firearm, and then maybe you're talking about them having to waive their right to privacy in order to purchase a firearm, and that's a debate that people are going to have to have, whether they think that makes sense on that. On the personalization, right now, there's a German company that's out and has a, um, a ring of sorts that uses it, that connects with uh, something on the gun that personalizes. I think that's probably not the best, the most effective way to do it. Uh, biometrically is the way that we're looking at doing it, so that the biometrics in your palm and your hand match up with that of the gun. Uh, we're pretty much there with technology, that's why we give them a period of time to perfect it, and with the statute allows for grants through the Department of Justice to get that down so that you'd be able to uh, program that gun for yourself or whoever else in your family or uh, whatever was authorized to use it, but nobody else on that basis. And that's why we provide the grants, the money to do that, get the research done, and then the time period to implement it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you guys so much. This has been a wonderfully informative debate um, and discussion, rather, I should say. Um, we have a couple more minutes to open it up to both the Lynn campus and here if you have a question. Um, and do you want to go back? And please address it to either Jim Wallace, Congressman Tierney, or of course, Police Chief Tucker. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan. Uh, Congressman Tierney, why not more gun safety education compared to um, you know, personalized weapons? I have no objection to more uh, gun safety legislation. In fact, the NRA used to do more of that than, uh, than the lobbying that they do today. So I think that if you have a good system for it and people provide for it, I know the chief must have an education program. He can probably tell you a little bit about it sure. uh, on that basis. Thank you. We're actually looking to uh, implement something in Salem. It's actually very timely. Um, I, I just spoke with the mayor last week. Uh, we're looking at putting a gun safety course together. We're very fortunate that we have a five-bay range at the police station. So we're going to try to put something together and offer it to our citizens in terms of uh, safe handling and safe storage. And I think that I think your question is very good. And I think that's the direction that, that uh, part of this debate should be going in. I, I mentioned earlier in my remarks the training that the police officers have to go through. Um, I don't think for a citizen it would have to be that extensive, but currently the requirement is zero. So I think that, that uh, I think that's going in the right direction. I think your question is a good one. Okay, thank you. Oops. I just commit to the end of that. We were over at Lynn Classical High School about a week or two ago, and interestingly, in the course of that debate, there were students that thought there should be no restrictions at the beginning, and other students who went all the way to the other end of thinking there should be no guns. But in the course of the discussion between each other, somebody brought up the idea of education, and it seemed like everybody settled on that would be a good thing. And then somebody brought up the idea of making a requirement that people, if they have a gun, keep it safely in their home. That centered around children. Uh, as soon as the discussion got to be children, if you had a house and there were children in it, weren't you responsible to keep the gun in a safe way? And even people who had started the discussion were saying you had, can't have restrictions at all, all of a sudden were saying, well, yeah, that makes sense. So if we have a, a, a debate that's balanced on this, we can probably come to some accord on things like education on that. But it doesn't obviate uh, the idea to stretch and try to go a little further, like the personalized handgun, which I think is a win-win for everybody. Okay. Thank you. We have a question from the Lynn, uh, Lynn campus. Please go ahead. Um, my name is Rebecca White. This is for Paul Tucker, the police chief. Um, what can private citizens do to help, um, to help, sorry, to help protect themselves from gun violence when you can't, when the police, uh, the time for the police getting to a scene is, can be significant depending on where you live? or depending on where it is. Thank you. A um, couple of points to that question about what, what can citizens do to protect themselves um, in the advent that the police aren't there. A couple of things. One is uh, police officers, we work on information. And information, as fast as we can get it and as fast as we can transform it into, into law enforcement action, obviously helps us. One of the things I had mentioned earlier is looking, looking at uh, the analysis of a number of these shootings. People knew things along the way. If we look at the, at the Virginia Tech shooting, if we looked at Columbine, if we looked at Aurora, and now unfortunately we look at Sandy Hook, every one of those had people come forward that said, gee, I knew this or I knew that. 
or I saw some odd behavior. Some, some mental health professionals, some medical people that thought that they had some restrictions about what they could share with the police. I think that an open uh, avenue of information is the best thing that we can do. Uh, the second part of it is that if, if you do feel the need that there is a, a, a need for a handgun, um, you can make an application. And this is something that, you know, that, that I, I could probably find some common ground uh, with goal on, that if you have uh, met all of the requirements and there's no restrictions, then you can lawfully own a handgun. But I think helping the police do their job, it, a lot of it I think has to do with um, it's, the, it's something that the MBTA just started. It's called see something, say something. You can't be afraid to share it. I would rather check out 100 tips that every one of them turn out to be a dead end than have somebody hold one and not say something and have it turn out to be valuable information. Thank you. We're not going to take any more questions right now. We're running out of time, but I'm going to turn it over to Bernadette Lucas. Great. Great. Thank you for all, for everybody for being here. I'm certainly um, hoping that you had a great opportunity to try to come to some conclusions on this very difficult subject. I think there's a lot of thank yous for today. I, I would like to thank, uh, thank our experts, uh, Executive Director Jim, Jim Wallace, uh, Chief Police Paul Tucker, and Congressman Tierney, as well as Wayne Burton and Kathy Anderson, who've worked very closely with us to try to get this organized. We have all the people and facilities and media and the public relations people to thank you. I want to say that the committee that worked together on this was just absolutely outstanding. I cannot believe what work was done in such a short time. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you people for coming and sharing with us today, sharing with us your questions and your time. So thank you, everybody, for making this possible. And again, thank you very much for speaking. Thank you.